Good morning. Here we are, another week of dealing with you at home and us here in the sanctuary. A few of us, we're not breaking any rules. We're making sure that we are in full compliance. We have a few of us here today uh, doing our best to bring you another worship service via technology. And there are just a couple of things that I would like to say about that. You're going to notice some music today, and you're going to see the choir today, and you're going to uh, uh, detect people around here today. That was pre-recorded from last year, and we just were thinking this week that it would be nice to see our choir, hear our choir, and also to be involved in music that we are unable to produce while we're all cordoned off in our own homes. So that's what's happening today. Again, we're not breaking any rules regarding public assembly or gatherings, but we're wanting to bring to you uh, some of the music and some of that blessing that we're accustomed to on a regular basis here at Faith Memorial. Again, it's a joy to be with you. I do wish it was face-to-face, and in my contact with many of you this week, you have echoed that same sentiment. So we're looking forward to the day when we're going to be able to come back together and worship together. Uh, Until that time, we will continue to to, uh, be blessed by and benefited by uh, the use of technology to draw us together and keep us connected. Now, I have a responsibility today. This is not showing any favoritism, but this is just expressing uh, to some of you. You've been in contact with me. You've shared with me maybe what your children have been doing as you have been watching uh, live streaming and and worshiping with us via live stream. So I'm just going to pay attention to that today and keep promises today that I indicated that I would keep. And after all, to our children, if I don't keep these promises, what will they think about their pastor? So first of all, uh, to Jillian and to Gina and Josephine and John, I'm going to wave at you. I'm waving at you today because I heard last week from your mother that while you watch live stream you wave at me so I told her I would wave back so I'm waving back to uh, Jillian to Gina Josephine and John and then I also have just a special word to Kinsey Josie Maisie and Kellen Uh, we love you and you are all today representing you four children are are representing or maybe the eight children are representing Uh, how much we miss all of our kids, how much we miss them bounding down the hall and being a part of of Faith Kids and worship in Hermes Chapel. We miss you and we love you. And especially, I know that Josie is celebrating a birthday and her prayer partner wants to wish her a very, very happy birthday. So why not get those things in? After all, you're you're comfortable at home. You're not waiting to get to a drive-thru a restaurant or go somewhere afterwards so we can take a little bit of extra time and share those uh, well wishes uh, with, with, our, with our kids, with our children, with our families. So we're glad that you can be with us. Love you all, miss you all, and look forward to seeing you soon. Some of you I've seen by distance. In fact, uh, some of you have made drive-bys, and we have also been able to wave as you have, uh, uh, as you've driven by and as you've honked your horns and 
as you have expressed well wishes, we thank you for uh, at least being able to see you from a distance. I also want to thank Bill and Betty Cox, and I want to thank Fred Nolan for working so hard to uh, beautify, especially the, the front of our building. Uh, they worked, um, didn't get too close, but they worked uh, to, uh, this last week in preparing the uh, flower beds, and they worked hard on that. It looks beautiful. I want to thank Fred Booker for mowing and also Pastor Jared Massey for trimming. It looks beautiful around here. We're ready to, to welcome people to, to our facility, but yet we cannot come together. So if you get a chance, if you're out for a drive, drive by and just notice how beautiful things look around here. And again, thank you to all who have helped. Then I also want to mention Holy Week. This is the commencing of Holy Week. And I want to mention to you what we plan to do. We will, we will be sending a one call and also an email and get the word out to you. But we will have service this Monday, Thursday at 7 p.m. We will live stream that service. During that service, I'll provide a, a little bit of a, of a message from God's word. And then I will instruct you where you are at your homes on receiving uh, the elements for communion. So I want you to be prepared and have uh, maybe some unleavened bread if you're able to bake some bread or something that will stand in for that. And also if you will have some juice available, we will uh, ask you to follow instructions and serve your family. We do not want you to miss out on communion. So that will be a part of Monday Thursday. Uh, this coming Thursday evening at 7 p.m. And then we also plan to have Good Friday service at 12 p.m. And I encourage you to uh, be a part of that worship service. Dr. Case will be uh, sharing God's Word, and we just encourage you to uh, join us for Good Friday. Also, the uh, denomination will be providing a live stream service on Good Friday at 7 p.m., and I know that uh, our current general superintendent and two previous general superintendents will be sharing in that time together. So Dr. Dan Tipton, uh, Dr. Tom Hermes, and Dr. Mike Holbrook will be presenting uh, God's Word to us, sharing some thoughts with those who can join by live stream. And then uh, we will also have music, I believe, provided by Susan Jones. So uh, remember that. On, uh, on Holy Week, and then Easter Sunday morning, on Resurrection Sunday morning, we will meet again for live stream uh, at 10.30 a.m. I believe that's all I'm going to share with you at this point as far as announcements are concerned, but we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then again, because of technology and from our service a year ago, we will join in worship together in song. Father, we come to you this beautiful day, and we've had several days of just beautiful reminders of life emerging and beautiful blooms and blossoms surrounding us. We thank you, Lord, for what you are giving us in gifts and what we're able to see, what we're able to take in. These are all hopeful signs for us that all that we are enduring as a world, and that which seems to just preoccupy so much of each day, we do believe this too shall pass. And we are trusting you for new life, and we are trusting you for victory through all of this. We are trusting you for uh, protection, and we are trusting you for grace. And as we come together to worship today, we pray that you would just ignite our hearts wherever we are, Wherever we may be watching, help us to sing together and rejoice together and celebrate your word and celebrate your truth. And may we also just live in the constancy and live in the confidence that you are our God. We are your children. You love us. We love you. You have first loved us. You have exhibited that. And we pray that you would help us today to worship you in spirit and and in truth. Ignite our hearts to praise and unite our hearts in worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
will glorify the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Sing it on this Palm Sunday, would you? be seated. Ushers, would you come forward to wait upon us for our morning offerings? We think of that great day when our Lord came to Jerusalem to the shouts and the praises of people. We understand how fickle that kind of crowd can be. And we pray that our lives will not be that way, that we will continue and forever give him the praise and the glory he deserves. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day that we honor the multitude that praised you that day. And we know that in many ways, dear Father, our praises sometimes are stilled. We pray, dear Father, that as we think about that this morning, that you would help us to determine that our lives will always be a sacrifice to you, to your honor, and to your glory. As we give our gifts this morning, may that be part of our praise. Help us, dear Father, as we go through this holy week, that we might take time to think, to ponder about our great Savior's love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Well, we're thankful for technology, and I appreciate the uh, wonderful ministry of our choir. We're fortunate every week to be blessed by uh, their leading us into worship, and especially prior to the sharing of God's Word, they are always a blessing for our congregation. And we thank Pastor Mike also for his leadership in uh, the choir ministry. I want you to look uh, together with me today from Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to read the first 11 verses of Matthew chapter 21. I'm reading from the New American Standard uh, Version. Um, This is a marvelous passage of Scripture that I trust God will take and apply to our hearts today and encourage us with it and speak volumes of great truth to us. Matthew 21, 1 through 11. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately He will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, And brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him, and those who followed, were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The passage of Scripture that is cited from the Old Testament, uh, especially the one uh, that speaks to the fulfillment of what Jesus had told his disciples they would find. Let me read that text to you. That's found in Zechariah 9, 9, and I want just to share that with you. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of of a donkey. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. What a statement in Zechariah chapter 9. <clears throat> this prophet, one of the last prophets to speak, one of the last prophets to deliver his heart and to share with the children of Israel and ultimately with the world that indeed their king was coming. Now, can you imagine a promise, not only moving throughout the entire Old Testament, but the promise that Zechariah utters in chapter 9 and verse 9 of his writings, his inspired account. Can you imagine that being a little over five centuries? That's over 500 years before, finally, the day comes when Jesus enters Jerusalem on this momentous occasion for this monumental week. Over 500 years elapses before this promise and this prophecy is fulfilled. So I want us, as much as we possibly can, it will take some imagination, but as much as as we possibly can, I want us to enter into the sense of having waited not just 500 years, that was from one of the great messianic texts in Scripture, but going all the way back to every predicting verse, 
every verse that prophesies about Jesus coming. Think about all throughout time, the people of Israel long awaiting the coming of their king. Enter into that if you can, and just a little bit into that context if you're able. But understand that we too are in that same setting. You and I are also encountering this period of waiting for our King to come. We're between His first advent and His second coming, but we too are waiting. But I want to say to us today, in a matter of faith, in a matter of great confidence, with much of the story already confirmed, I just want to say to you today, the King is coming. The King is coming. Not in the sense that I want to try to hype you up. Not in the sense that I want to just try to overshadow world events and current events. But I just want to remind us of a reality that is central to our faith. Just as it was for the children of Israel, the first coming, the Messiah's promised coming, so we too recognize we live in the reality of this truth. The King is coming. So I just want to hold us to, to a sense of expectancy. I want to hold us to the story of faith, and I want us to be reminded the King is coming. You know, Jesus is an interesting figure. He's, he's at times a troubling figure. He is most of the time a convicting figure. He is indeed one who comes in ways and ministers in ways as we see words lift off of the pages of the gospel and as we see them come alive and as we put our faith and trust in Jesus. Jesus is a remarkable figure. He's a drawing figure. He compels us to come and look at Him and to listen to Him. But most of the time, He is a convicting figure and He's a troubling figure. And one of the reasons for that is He is so unlike us. He is so unlike us. Now while we recognize that there is this inescapable truth that Jesus is unlike us, I don't want us to forget that we are called to be like Him. So let's just revisit that. As much as Jesus is unlike us, as much as Jesus is a troubling figure to us because of that opposite pole reality, let's remember this. As, as disturbing at times as that can be and as convicting as that reality can be, don't forget the fact that we are called to be like Him. So He is a convicting figure. He's a troubling figure he is one that is unlike us, yet we are called to be like Him. So may God help us today not to lose that. And may God help us also to keep in our hearts that indeed the King, this King, this particular unique King is coming. The account here just gives us a window into Jesus that in many respects is staggering and at the same time he, he's so inviting to us he's so peculiar to us but at the same time he is inviting to us and I, wa I want us to see that today as Jesus was preparing to enter into Jerusalem for this fateful week for this marvelous week but also this perilous week this demanding week as Jesus was about to enter into all that was coming to a focus and all that was kind of rising to a crescendo as far as God's purpose is concerned, He stops for a moment in what seems to be a sidebar note, but it's not. It's, it's really not one of those things that is just um, a side note or an afterthought or uh, a little, little tidbit here or, or there. It is indeed a part of the story that is indeed compelling. Jesus never misses a detail that provides enough evidence and provides fulfillment for those who will pay enough attention. He never misses a moment to dot the prophetic I or cross the prophetic T. He never misses a moment 
to give ample evidence to his onlookers that he is indeed the Messiah. But he does it in ways that are so foreign to us. And he does it in ways that I find, again, drawing to my own heart and drawing to my own attention that I want to take a moment and note it today. Rather than banners streaming all over the place that the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is finally here, and His name is Jesus, His name is Jesus. Rather than His name in lights, rather than some kind of, of a remarkable uh, performance to kind of stage the moment, re- none of that is seen in this entrance into Jerusalem. Rather, everything about Jesus that so draws us and so compels us is an opposite. It's an opposite of who we are and it's an opposite of how we think. Jesus pauses as he's getting ready to enter Jerusalem and he gives instruction to two of his disciples. I want you to go into this city. I want you to go into this town and I want you to look for a donkey that is tied and I want you to look for her colt and when you find them I want you to untie them and I want you to bring them to me and when you bring them to me note this that if you're asked the question basically what are you doing with my donkey (laughs) who do you think that is let them know that the Lord needs them now again this is not just some aside This is a marvelous glimpse into who Jesus is. You see, this is a fulfillment of that which would have been prophesied over 500 years prior to this. And Matthew, who is often the gospel writer of fulfillment, we have about nine times in Matthew's gospel where Matthew says it is written it is written we also have at least 12 times in Matthew's gospel where he talks about so it would be fulfilled that it might be fulfilled so Matthew is the gospel writer of fulfillment so in this moment we have one of these great prophecies fulfilled so that there can be no doubt among the disciples and among those who are the onlookers that Jesus is indeed the sent one, that He is the Messiah. He's the long-awaited one. Sometimes we look at Jesus and we look at these moments and we search the Gospels and we say, why didn't they get it? Why didn't they understand? And Why, especially during this honed week why is it that so many lapsed into indifference or lapsed into blindness why didn't they see why didn't they know why didn't they call out why didn't they love why didn't they serve why didn't they fall at Jesus's feet and say he is the Messiah why do we have just this one time and in in five days or so it evaporates and The shouts move to jeers and and the shouts of praise move to crucify Him. Why do we have such a scene that is laid out before us? We can say, my goodness, they had the Scriptures. They had the prophets. They had the prophecies. They had everything that pointed to Jesus and what He would be like and why He would come and what He would do. But I would just say this to us. Don't be too hard on them. We have the Scriptures too. We not only have the Old Testament, but we have the New. Not only do we have at times some of those veiled prophecies that are messianic in the Old Testament embedded in the text, but we have all of it unveiled. We have all of it revealed. We don't have, we don't have a, a wonderment about who it will be and, and wondering what His name will be called, but we know He is Jesus. We know He is Emmanuel. We know that He is the one who is God with us. We have His nativity. We have His ministry. We have His passion. We have His death. We have His resurrection. We have His ascension. We have the Scriptures too. Don't be too hard on these folks and say why they had the Scriptures. Why didn't they see? We have the Scriptures too. We have the Scriptures too.
And may God help us not to miss what is so obvious, who is so obvious, and who is herein so beautifully depicted and described. So what does Jesus do? Jesus talks about donkeys. It's kind of remarkable to me that here He is heading into Jerusalem. But yet at this moment, He's precise. He's detailed. And He's talking about donkeys. You know, I'm not going to get too far off the path, but I'm reminded of another donkey and how God supernaturally used another donkey, Balaam's donkey. Isn't it interesting that God doesn't seem to have any kind of pushback with animals? Isn't it kind of interesting that as God moves among His created order and as God makes appeal and as God finds usefulness, you don't hear the donkeys even giving pushback. He came to His own, His own world, His own creation, His own things, His own making, but it was only His own people that ever rejected Him. So here He is another moment animating and using animal life. I wonder what all the, the donkey and her colt picked up on that day. I wonder what all they were let in on. I, I wonder if, if they had a sense of how this moment was so historically significant. I wonder what God let them in on. But that's not the message today. I just want you to think about that. Isn't it remarkable uh, how detailed Jesus is? But Jesus is also remarkably humble, impoverished, emptied, in his own sense of himself. He knows perfectly who he is. But in his promotion of himself, he is empty. I have always found that captivating about Jesus. What Jesus calls us to be, what Jesus calls us to do, is embodied and enacted in who he is. He is the Messiah. He proves who He is. Even those two disciples and the others will, would realize that a king is noted in such ways. That when an individual rides in on a, a colt or rides in on a donkey that's never been ridden before, there's a reaction, there's a response of the people to recognize, here comes our anointed king. But what is also significant about this moment is Jesus knows who He is. He knows who He is. He's not worried about that. He's, he's not in any way frantic about that. He knows who He is, but He doesn't promote who He is. He knows who He is, but He doesn't promote who He is. Here's what I've found is common among people. We don't know who we are, and we promote who we are. We don't know who we are, and we promote who we are. Jesus knew perfectly who He is, but never promoted who He is. Rather submits to the humbling reality of not riding in on some grand steed, but riding in to Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. You know, there are a lot of thoughts I've had in my mind this week, but I can't share them. <laughs> There's some things that I would like to say, but I can't share them. But I'll just let you know that my mind has been going down certain avenues, and I want you to know that your prayers for me, God's hold on me, and Sharma's reminders to me are keeping me in check. I just want you to know that today. I've had a lot of time to think about some of these things and some tracks that I've taken. I just cannot share today. Just suffice it to say that um, these donkeys that we mentioned were just completely, completely malleable, useful. Just, just think about that. Jesus comes to us as one who is so humble that he does not in any way seek to grandstand or say, to the world 
here I am. He is the Messiah who proves who He is and the power that He has to do all that He knows He is to do. He is perfectly self-aware, but He is never self-promotional. Second, Jesus fulfills the prophecy about Himself without ever being full of Himself. Jesus fulfills the prophecy about Himself without ever being full of Himself. How do we say that? Not only by His actions, not only by what we witness, not only what the text tells us, but while, while we also look at the New Testament, we come across places like Philippians 2, where we are called to have the same disposition in us, the same mindset in us that was also in Christ Jesus. And what is, what is one of the descriptors found in that text? He emptied Himself. Everything that was legitimately Jesus or legitimately the Son of God, He emptied Himself. He emptied Himself. Himself. So I can say with absolute assurance as he is getting ready to enter Jerusalem, he fulfills the prophecy about himself without ever being full of himself. I've shared this with you before. It's not my illustration, but it's a good one. Some folks are so stuck on themselves, they're like a piece of tape and they're of no use and of no value. Not Jesus. He quietly reveals that He is the focus of the prophecy of over 500 years prior to this in Zechariah 9.9. Third point that I want us to mention is this. You know, this arrival in Jerusalem that we have read about and the way that the people reacted and the commotion that was caused, the stirring in Jerusalem, is a reminder to me of how prone we are to a mob response and how prone we are to kind of have our own sense of excitement build by the, by the actions and even the reactions of others. How easily moved we are. We are so sheep-like. We are very, very sheep-like. Easily stirred up. And that was the case as the commotion increased. And as people's actions demonstrated a king is coming, those unmistakable actions, laying down their, their robes so that the donkey would, would not touch the ground, and, and palm branches and other branches from, from trees laid down in front of the donkey as it moved along and carried Christ. There's a frenzy that is developing. There is a peaked sense of urgency that is developing. It's rolling on its own. It's increasing as it goes. Therefore, as many would be preaching probably today and would be speaking today, they would talk about this as Jesus' triumphal entry. A triumph. A triumph. But yet at the same time, even though there's a lot of noise and even though there is a flurry of activity, I think there's a degree of kind of, of Monday morning quarterbacking taking place as we look back and call it the triumphal entry. And yes, we know what's coming. Yes, we know what He's come to do. Yes, we know nothing is going to impede His purpose. But yet at the same time, Jesus is just the opposite of the triumphant entry. The triumph here is in His unassuming manner. While all the crowd around Him is going crazy, He is shockingly unassuming. He's the opposite of us. Rather than taking advantage of an already worked up crowd, Jesus is the quiet one. Jesus is the resolute one. Jesus is the focused one. He's shockingly impoverished, frankly, true to form from his birth to this week. 
He is the one who is coming to atone on the cross, and he hasn't even had a place in his adult life to lay his head. He is the impoverished one who is now being hailed as a king. But he does invite all essential faith, the all essential faith of the world. He invites people to himself. He calls people to trust in him. He brings people to focus upon him while he deflects all of the accolades and all of the attention. He is such an opposite of everything that we would consider king-like. He's kind of the antithetical king, if we could put it that way. We have such a view of glamour and glitz and dress and colors and, and display and pomp and circumstance, and Jesus is the antithesis of all of that. He's the opposite of all of that. In fact, He is the opposite of all that is humanly proud, prideful, everything that we ever seek. He is the opposite. He triumphs over pride and grandstanding by being humble. He is poor and therefore cannot be bought by the affluence of this world. He is meek and gentle, full of kindness and compassion, even to those who when He looks at their faces, He knows they will be the ones that vote to kill Him. In fact, His ride into Jerusalem, His city, by the way, his ride into Jerusalem, his city, he's the owner of it. He's the proprietor of it. He enters his city, yet he does not demand his subjects to bow to him. Rather, he enters the city, which is the center of those who say they worship him and are looking for him, who would cry out in that moment, Hosanna, save us, save us now, or deliver us and make us prosperous and give us a good year, all that that has come from in the Old Testament. In this moment of acclaim and in this moment of approval, we are just days away from the fact that they will say away with Him, away with Him, crucify Him crucify him here is the shock of all shocks and i pray that it sinks in today jesus came as a king but jesus came as a king to be murdered by his subjects and he rides in to jerusalem humble meek merciful compassionate, resolute, knowing that He is coming as a king, entering, yes, the arena of His subjects, but He is coming to be killed. This has to be, His death is the ransom price for their souls. It has to happen. It has to be. And I want to remind us today, it has to be. It has to be. Because not only has He come to ransom their souls, but He has come to ransom ours. The actions of the people, whether caught up in the heat of the moment or in a few cases genuinely convinced, they welcome Jesus as their anointed King. And the garments and the bra branches and the shouts and, and the joy and the text that is, is fulfilled, victory, success, the anointed one, our king, has come. He's visited us. He's coming as a conqueror into his city. He certainly is that, too. He certainly is a conqueror. He certainly has come to destroy the works of the devil. He is the lamb that is coming to be slaughtered to take away the sin of the world. He is indeed a victor. He is a conqueror. But to be a victor, he yields his life as a victim. The Hebrew that is uttered is Hoshiana 
Hoshiana, it means we appeal to our king with our complaints. We appeal to the king with our grievances. Save us now. Hear us now. Meet our needs now. Hosanna in the highest. Defeat our enemies and give us a prosperous year. In all of the commotion, in all of the commotion, there is the Christ. In all of the chaos, there is the quiet. There is the resolved. There is the purposed and the one with great intention. He is the prophet that is to be raised up that is prophesied in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. The shouts of praise will shift in this week. But I pray as we look back, even as we're moving in the footsteps of Jesus, we don't move in the footsteps of Jesus if we don't know the, as if we don't know the end of the story. So as we know the end of the story, I do encourage you today to rejoice. I do encourage you today to praise because the King is coming. The King is coming. Adam Clark made this statement in his commentary on Matthew. He said, what is sad is even when they get it right, they stick, it, they stick with it for maybe five days. Even when they get it right, they stick with it for maybe five days. I implore you, I implore you, as people that hear enough gospel every week to save the world, I implore you with these last words. Jesus is, is king. Jesus is the king. That matter is concluded. That matter is resolved. Jesus is the king. Jesus is the king, albeit different, opposite, than anything and everything we ever expect, still Jesus is the King. Jesus is the King, and we are not. Jesus is the King, and we are not. And let me just add, Jesus is the King, and you are not. Jesus is the King, I am not. Jesus is the King, I will submit to Him. Jesus is the King. I will pray for God's help to come to the place where I without reserve love Him. Jesus is the King. I will love Him. Jesus is my King. I will follow Him. Jesus is my King. I will serve Him. Jesus is my King. Jesus is my King. Father in heaven, gracious Savior, faithful witness, of all of this gracious spirit we pray that in the matchless holy beautiful and compelling name of Jesus remind us today in our homes with our families or if we are alone with you remind us that this is a settled matter that you are Jesus. You are the King. May it though also be a settled matter today of individual faith, individual trust, individual dependence that we can say, Jesus, you are my King. I pray that this can be without question a witness.
that this can be without question our testimony, that this can be our reality. Jesus, you are my King. I love you. Jesus, you are my King. I submit to you. Jesus, you are my King. I follow you. Jesus, you are my King. I submit to you. Jesus, you are my King. May it be so in every one of our hearts in a fresh and in a real up-to-date way. Jesus, you are our King. You have come and Jesus, you are coming again. Thank you for joining us today and being with us via live stream. It's good to know that you're out there. And thank you. Many of you have contacted us, whether it's by text or phone call or email this week. 
And you've let us know that you've been participating, not just watching, but participating when you are able. And we're delighted to know that. I would just say a a couple of closing things today. First of all, let us know you're out there. We will be calling you and we're praying with individuals when we do. And we're wanting to go through our entire list of, of members and with our attendees and, and visit uh, by phone and to have prayer together. But, you know, phones work both ways. So get a hold of us. Let us know how you're doing. And if you have a need, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We will be glad to minister to you in any way that we can. Also, I want to thank you for giving. You have been such a faithful congregation in giving. You've been giving online, you have been sending in tithes and offerings, or you have been physically coming to the building and dropping them off, and you can continue to do that, and we encourage you uh, to do so. The office hours are Mondays and Wednesdays from uh, 9 in the morning until 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so if you do want to stop uh, at the office, you can gain entrance at that time. We also have many who are in need of our prayers and as we have been receiving prayer requests we want to pass them along to you so these are names that uh, we want to mention and we will pray for as we close our time together today barb burford is back up at ohio state university hospital we're praying for her and we're praying for mark may also christina may christina is daughter of Larry and Dorothy Bruning and she has been in she's in the healthcare uh, work and in that field and she has been very ill and uh, we have been praying for her so continue to do so Steve Sullivan Carol Tufts uh, Nancy Lynn and uh, you have also the family of Charles McNichol we continue to remember them in uh, the loss of Charles Tess Akers Ann Cassidy Bob Ehrman Ramona Inskeep, Sherry Landis, Tim Good. We're also remembering um, a family that is connected to Jennifer Snyder. Uh, We we found out on uh, the end of this last week that uh, Jennifer's sister uh, is the parent and then grandparent of uh, a family that were affected by a house fire. And in that house fire, Tragically, uh, a four-year-old um, little girl did not survive. <clears throat> While siblings have been treated and are also in care, uh, this precious little life uh, did not survive. So we want to remember the family uh, and pray for those who are grieving today in this loss. I'm beginning to get word as well from around the denomination and beyond and back even where, where I have pastored before, that there are people that we know that have been affected by uh, COVID-19. We want to remember these folks and just pray that God will give them strength and God will give them recuperative power and that God will indeed raise them up. So let's join together as we remember uh, these requests as we close in prayer. Once again, Father, we declare our dependence upon you. We've been reminded in these days, oh, how desperately we need you. We know that life is indeed, as James has said, it is simply like a vapor. And we are far more fragile and we are all the more dependent than what we would ever like to admit. But may we admit it today and may we confess it today that we know how needy we really are. And Lord, there isn't a moment that goes by in a given day that we do not need you. So in these matters and in these physical needs and in these heartbreaking moments, in the presence of loss, in all that we are expressing today as a prayer request, we pray for these needs. Raise up the infirm. Raise those who have been Affected by this virus, strengthen them, we pray, and fortify their immune systems. And we pray as well, Father, keep our people well. Keep us, Lord, um, being careful, cautious, vigilant. Help us to be people of prayer. Help us to be 
ministering to our loved ones and to our neighbors and to those closest to us. Use us in ways that can be truly the expressions of Jesus to our world today. So give us, Lord, all of that strength that we need. Protect us and keep us and be with our people. And Father, especially comfort those who are grieving today and bring solace as only you can bring it. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the presence of your Spirit. Work, we pray, in all of our lives. Work in the leaders of our nation, the leaders of our state, our local governmental leaders. But Father, work in us around the world as people and remind us that we have indeed a Savior. We need not look any further. We have a Savior. He is Jesus, the Lord. Our King has come, and our King is coming again. Father, may we today draw our hope and our strength from that reality that Jesus has come to be our great King. Be with our people. Bless this ministry. Honor your word in this world. Bring about salvation, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. We love you and we miss you. We miss your faces, your voices. We look forward to worshiping together as soon as possible. God bless you. Have a good day, a good Lord's Day.